have um, two very similar paintings and let's go ahead and look at them now and what's different, what's the same, compare and contrast them. The first one, we know the similarities are the names of the titles of the painting are The Three Musicians by Diego Vasquez and Three Musicians by Pablo Picasso. So this side is Diego Vasquez, this side is Pablo Picasso. This was made in 1618, this one was made in 1921. So there's almost 300 years between these two, which is pretty... Um, it's a pretty big gap, and so when we look at them, it's fun to see, hey, 300 years ago, this is what they wanted to say, and then 300 years later, this is what they wanted to say in terms of the artist. Now, a couple of similarities that we can find right away. We see that there are three musical instruments here. I can see two, but we still have a violin, and this one has a guitar, so there's two string instruments. We also see they're sitting at a table at probably a restaurant, same in this area. We see the corner of the room um, for our one point perspective, and we see the corner of the room for the one point perspective. We see three men, although they'd be very abstract, and three men, uh, maybe a child or younger, um, younger man maybe. And so there's three and three. We see... Um, that there is a dog hiding back here. So here's an animal. And there is a monkey back here. So there is an animal. These are really similar paintings, but because this one is not promoting cubism and abstract, it looks completely different. If you hung these up next to each other in a museum, you would get quite a response on how different they really look. So today we're going to talk a little bit about cubism, but I wanted you to see what two paintings that look similar but have different techniques and uh, a different part of a different movement could look like. So let's go ahead and let's move to our next step. Okay, so as we talk about cubism, if I was gonna go ahead and paint this egg or draw this egg, I might render it to look exactly like the way it is, and that's called realism. To make this egg look exactly how it appears in real life is called realism. I'm gonna show you a quick example of cubism and how to deconstruct this egg. This is kind of cubism. What I did is I took the egg, it's still an egg, but I took pieces of it, moved it around, rearranged it, and put it back onto a flat surface. So cubist artists are taking a three-dimensional object, taking it apart, and reconstructing it in unique ways, showing different perspectives onto a 2D, 2D surface. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the birth of cubism, or the beginning of cubism. Now, when we think about cubism, we mostly think about Picasso and Brock. We think about that, that friendship combination, and we think those two are the people that created it, and that's it. But it's a little bit more complex than that. So think about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. What makes up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Well, in the title, PB&J, or peanut butter and jelly, those are what you think of immediately. You think of those two ingredients. You think of the peanut butter and the jelly. When you think about cubism, oftentimes you think about Picasso and Barack, but there's a piece that's missing that's really crucial to it, the bread. In a sandwich, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you don't have a sandwich unless you have the bread. And for cubism, the bread is Cezanne. Cezanne inspires both Pablo Picasso and Barack. So without Cezanne, they don't have cubism. But Barack, or sorry, Barack and Picasso met in 1905, and in Picasso in 1907 showed Barack his first cubistic painting. Now they saw, thought it wasn't ready, and people really wouldn't um, accept it in the art world, so they didn't display it until 1916. So there's a lot of time that went by. In the meantime, though, once pa Pablo Picasso inspired Barack, they both came together to start to take apart. Um, images show different perspectives 
and rely heavily on color and shape. When Henri Matisse uh, described it, he described them as being comprised of cubes, which is why you got the word cubism. And at the beginning of the movement, people were not accepting of it, just like um, Pablo Picasso and Georges Baroque thought they wouldn't be. They weren't ready for it. But over time, people fell in love with the style, and now it's one of the most iconic styles in art history. But it took a lot of courage to actually be able to go out and try something completely new. Now, it's important to remember that while Picasso and Barack are considered the founders, Cezanne with his bold colors, big shapes, is just as important when we talk about cubism as our friendship duo here. Okay, we're gonna have two parts to this lesson today. Um, the first one is going to be what's called an analytic cubism, and the last one is gonna be synthetic cubism. So the analytic, analytic cubism is going to be more of a quick practice, so that's gonna be the first step in our videos. So what I want you to do is get a sheet of paper and get a pencil. Okay, with your sheet of paper, what I want you to do is fold it in half once, and then fold it in half twice. So when I open it back up, I will have four sheets, or four rectangles to draw inside of. So open it up, and I have one, two, three, four. Now with analytical cubism, or analytic cubism, what happens is you draw an object and then you draw it again and again and again, but you abstract it every single time you draw it. Now we remember that egg that we broke apart in that earlier in our lesson? It's gonna be similar. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take an animal that I like, which is my, one of my favorite animals is a seahorse. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a seahorse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first start off by drawing a seahorse, mostly realistic. Now these don't have to be very detailed drawings because these are our practice for our final, but you can go quick. Um, Pablo Picasso was using mostly in his, he was using bowls. And I'm gonna show you a quick example when we're done with this of his um, analytic uh, cubism. So I have my first seahorse, okay? Now I'm gonna draw that seahorse again, but this time I'm gonna start focusing more on the shapes that make up the seahorse. And I'm gonna make kind of these straight geometric lines, getting rid of any of my organic lines. And it can be nice and quick. And then I'm gonna do it again. But this time, I'm even gonna focus more on shapes that make up my seahorse. I might even break some of my seahorse apart like we saw in Mr. Wenzel's painting, start to just focus on what would be there. And last, I'm gonna do one more, and this one's gonna be my most abstract. I'm even gonna make the eye way bigger than it usually is. I'm going to start off by making these pieces float around. I really like the idea that I'm keeping just some of the very basics. And I can even put a line that goes through them to kind of attach them. And voila. So you can see that with analytic cubism, I start off with a realistic drawing and I slowly start to break it apart into these shapes, that's cubism. We did it with the egg, Mr. Wenzel did it with the human being, and now we've done it with our animal. You can pick any animal you want, it doesn't have to be a seahorse. If you can't think of an animal and you'd like to copy the seahorse, go ahead and do that, but I would challenge you to pick your favorite animal, okay? Now we're gonna move into our last step called synthetic cubism. Okay, so now I'm going to show you one of my favorite works of art. It's not something that I've created, it's something that I purchased. And there's a lot of people that create art, but there's also a lot of people that collect art. 
Um, in art history, there you'll learn about families that helped the Renaissance, all those great things. But for today, we're gonna focus on what I collect. So I have my favorite painting with me today. This is a cubistic painting by Mr. Wenzel. And I really like a couple different things about this painting. Number one is that you can look at it for a long period of time, and each time you look at it, you can kind of see something new. Uh, Mr. Wenzel did a really good job of taking a human that's hiding in there, make that human cubistic, and move pieces around with different colors, different shades, different tones. Um, to really get you to sit there and think about reconstructing it in your mind. Think about putting it back together like a puzzle that's been taken apart and then splashed all over. He did a wonderful job of creating a work of art that I think probably is my favorite thing that I own. And I hang it up in my apartment and people come over and they always are excited to see it. But let's ask uh, Mr. Wenzel a couple questions about this painting. So let's see if we can get a hold of him. Okay. All right, I'm here with Mr. Wenzel because I'm going to talk a little bit about the art piece that he created that we looked at in our video. Uh, Mr. Wenzel, um, what is cubism to you? Well, to me, cubism is probably um, a combination of the two studio habits envision and observe. So normally we use one or the other, and they're sort of opposite. But in cubism, you're drawing what you can see but you're also drawing what you can't see. So you're using your imagination and you have to make them fit together. You know, in real life, they wouldn't always fit together. So if I'm drawing a hand in cubism, I'm gonna draw this front part that I can keep, but I also wanna draw the back and I don't know what that looks like. And I don't know where it should go because normally it's not next to the front of the hand. It's, I'm gonna have to decide where to put it. So there's a lot of envision and observation. And I think it's trying to get those two to cooperate and work together. With your painting, um, what did you make? How did you make it? And about how long did it take to make? I um, made, well, it's a figure drawing, a, a, a cubistic figure drawing. So um, I painted it with oil paints. And I don't know how many people have used oil paints, but they, the nice thing about them is they're kind of like acrylic, except they don't dry out. things um, and they won't dry for days or even loose sometimes so they'll still be wet and it took me probably three to five days but just working maybe a little bit each day so maybe like a couple hours in the afternoon for three or five days very cool Earlier in our lesson, we looked at the three musicians and we looked at two different variations of it, one from Diego Vasquez and one from Pablo Picasso. We're going to focus more on Pablo Picasso's. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by doing a drawing of some musical instruments. So the only musical instrument that I currently have in my apartment right now is my violin. So now my goal is going to be drawing these things and then I'm going to make a synthetic cubistic piece. So Pablo Picasso looked at those shapes, those variations. What we're gonna do is start off with a realistic drawing or as close to a realistic drawing as we can of a violin. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off by making just the basic outline of it because I wanna know the height of it so I don't run out of space. So the top has a little bit of a, a trapezoid up top there and then I'm gonna make shapes coming out of it. Now it doesn't have to be perfect because Picasso wasn't focused on making something look hyper-realistic. He was focused on capturing shapes. So I have the stem there and now I'm going to make the body of the violin. Don't be afraid if you're making mistakes to go ahead, restart, rewind, erase, whatever you gotta do to get your violin where you want to have it. Make my strings. If you have a ruler, it's actually a lot nicer to use a ruler for your strings. All right. 
moment. I'm getting to right where to where I want to be. Okay, so a couple different things before we move on. With your violin, if you have um, colors, this would be a great time to go ahead and color that in uh, before we start cutting. Um, I'm going to use a shading pencil. I'm gonna shade mine, but it's up to you. Okay, so now with a synthetic um, cubism piece, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a scissors and I'm gonna go ahead and cut out my violin. Okay, so a couple things that I'm gonna draw on here is I'm gonna draw maybe some musical notes. Um, I might draw the bow. We talked about drawing that the bow for the violin. Okay. Um, let's see, what else could I add to my cubistic collage? I could add... Okay, so my last step is I need a glue stick. Um, liquid glue works fine too. I know a lot of people have the liquid glue because they're making, making slime. So whatever you want to use for that is fine. And I need one last sheet of paper. Okay. Now, with synthetic cubism, what the cubistic artist is doing is finding different ways to lay this on your paper. Ways that are creative, that are interesting. When we looked at the three musicians, they were broken apart and reassembled. That egg was broken apart and reassembled. Mr. Wenzel's human being was broken apart and reassembled. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my objects and I'm just going to cut them into some pieces. Don't make your pieces too small. But cut them apart. And my last, I did a, a note just to fill. Okay, now what my goal is going to be is to essentially put like that, when we put that egg back together, I'm going to put my collage or sorry, not my collage, my synthetic cubism. It is a collage, um, but Pablo Picasso was famous for doing this. I'm gonna start to lay it out. Now I want mine to still, I want my audience, the people viewing my artwork to still be able to tell what it is. So what I'm doing is I'm just moving my pieces a little bit. I'm not moving them super far apart because I still want to show the idea of what I started with so that my audience can still identify. Now, if you wanna make it more abstract, it'll be harder for your audience, which is also a fun, fun way to do it and actually a very creative way. But for our lesson today, I want you to kind of get it so that people can understand or see where we were going with it. Now I'm missing a piece of my violin. Oh, that's okay. Actually, that's actually good that you lose a piece too. It doesn't, um, you don't need every single piece. You can subtract a little bit when you're deconstructing too. Now I'm gonna do my bow that goes across my violin. Okay, so this is a really good uh, beginning. Now I have this whole background to play with, which means that I can go through now, and since I know what cubism is, I can go through and start to add different things, different elements to my background, and I can go ahead and fill this in. 
This is gonna be your final step, and this is gonna be what you turn in. So, take your time, deconstruct the violin, reconstruct it so that you have something called synthetic cubism, okay? All right, I would, cannot wait to see your artwork. Um, please stay safe and stay creative until next time. Okay, so for this next part, this is just an extra part of the assignment. You don't have to do this. Um, but if you'd like to, what we're gonna do is we're going to take a little bit of the principles that Mr. Wenzel was talking about with his cubism painting and the idea of different points of view within this same image. So I'm gonna take this uh, figurine that I have um, and I'm going to try to show you different sides of it on a flat two-dimensional surface. Now you can see, because I can rotate it all around, I can see all the different dimensions of it, which means this is a three-dimensional object. And now I'm gonna take that object and compress it. So get a sheet of paper and a pencil. And a good practice is starting off by, grab my pencil, starting off by picking a perspective. So I'm gonna start off and I'm gonna say, okay, I see eyes, maybe the face, start with the nose, a piece of the hair. I could even start like some of his muscles. Now, what a cubistic painter would do then is kind of rotate it and start drawing again. So maybe there's the earring over here now my hair is coming off the side, the side of my head. Exaggerate that a little bit. And now I might have like a fist. Some of these lightning bolts I'm gonna add in or towards the end. But then again, Flipping it over. Maybe add in the other arm now is facing the back. Flipping it again. And really what happens is you're trying to show all the different angles within the same flat two-dimensional surface. Now, obviously this looks pretty crazy. And what I would do is I would go back and just like Mr. Wenzel did with his painting, I would find different colors, different shapes that I wanna move around. And you can even break off pieces. Like if I want his boot to be all the way out here, that's perfectly fine. I have that option and you wanna be as creative as you can and kind of reassembling something that you've taken apart that is three-dimensional. So we, again, we took something that is 3D like this and we decided to draw all the different views of it. And I didn't do a top view or a bottom view, but I can do that as well onto a flat two-dimensional um, piece of paper. This is an extra assignment. If you finished all the other stuff and you want an extra challenge, Go ahead and find something in your apartment. If you don't wanna find something in your apartment, you're more than welcome to draw this figurine. What you can do is every time I put it down, you can pause it and every time I move it, you can pause it and then keep drawing it. That way I will give it to you this way. So you can go like this, press pause, this, press pause, this, press pause, this, oop, oop, oop. Press pause. Oops, I'll hold it like that. This, press pause. And this, press pause. Okay? So, good luck with that. Again, that's just an extra uh, assignment if you would like to do it.